For our scripture passage today, we are continuing the series we have in the book of Job called When Life Doesn't Make Sense. And today we're going to be looking at Job chapter 21. And before we read this, let's pause for a moment in prayer. Good and gracious Father, as we come before your word today, we ask, Lord, for your spirit to be with us. We ask that the, the same spirit that inspired these words would inspire us again. We pray, Lord, you would move in our hearts and our minds and our souls that we may hear, that we may read, and that we may understand your good and perfect will for us. Lord, bless this holy reading of your holy word, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This is Job chapter 21, verses 1 to 16. Listen now to the word of the Lord. Then Job answered and said, Keep listening to my words, and let this be your comfort. Bear with me, and I will speak, and after I have spoken, mock on. As for me, is my complaint against a man? Why should I not be impatient? Look at me and be appalled, and lay your hand over your mouth. When I remember I am dismayed, and shuddering seizes my flesh. Why do the wicked live, reach old age, and grow mighty in power? Their offspring are established in their presence and their descendants before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear, and no rod of God is upon them. Their bull breeds without fail, their cow calves, and does not miscarry. They send out their little boys like a flock, and their children dance. They sing to the tambourine and the lyre and rejoice to the sound of the pipe. They spend their days in prosperity, and in peace they go down to Sheol. They say to God, depart from us. We do not desire the knowledge of your ways. What is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what profit do we get if we pray to him? Behold, is not their prosperity in their hand? The counsel of the wicked is far from me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, there's some names that have become so associated with, with evil and depravity and wickedness. All you have to do is say the name, and it evokes images of all just uh, the, the wicked, evil things that they've done. Just, just a few names. All you have to do is say the name, and it makes you think of evil, e evil deeds. Take Charles Manson. Yep, you think Manson, boom, yeah, you, you think awful things. Uh, Adolf Hitler, that's an obvious one, right? You say his name, you think evil deeds. Uh, the Emperor Nero, that's another one, whose name is associated, name itself associated with infamy. Well, we've got another modern one, I think, that is beginning to be associated with wickedness and evil as well. It's the name of Jeffrey Epstein. Jeffrey Epstein, most of you have heard of him. If you've not, I'll give you a little, uh, just a little summary uh, Jeffrey Epstein is a man who could be the poster boy of depravity. He was the one that uh, assaulted dozens, if not hundreds, of young girls. When I say young girls, most of them were underage young girls. And not only was he a man who is now his name associated with depravity, he was a man of great wealth, of incredible power, great prestige and influence, a man that seemed to have fortune smile on him itself. Let me give you a little rundown of some of the things Jeffrey Epstein was able to acquire for himself and to enjoy. No one really knows how much money he was worth because no one really even knows today where he got all his money from. But at one point he was worth over $600 million. His properties included a, a, an apartment in Manhattan worth $50 million. He had a house in Palm Beach valued at $12 million. A ranch in New Mexico for $17 million and an apartment in Paris at $8.6 million. 
And oh yeah, he also had two islands that he owned with houses on them, and together they valued over $86 million. Epstein wasn't just a rich man. He was very influential. He had many famous friends, and pictures still exist today with him rubbing elbows with the likes of former President Bill Clinton and Donald Trump, and also Prince Andrew of the British royal family. Epstein also liked to party with celebrities, A-list names like Leonardo DiCaprio, Kevin Spacey, Bruce Willis. And he even spent time with the famed physicist Stephen Hawking and the legal expert Alan Dershowitz. And if all this wasn't bad enough, or fortunate enough for him, Epstein seemed to be a guy that could get away with anything. Uh, he was arrested in 2006 after a woman called in reporting a sexual assault on her daughter who was 14 years old. And Epstein was arrested and they started an investigation and they found just layer upon layer of crime and depravity. They found that he had assaulted dozens perhaps of hundreds of girls and, and, and even worse is he got the young girls he assaulted to go recruit more girls for him. In a documentary I saw on him uh, just this week, uh, one girl admitted to recruiting over between 40 and 60 girls herself for Jeffrey Epstein and paid $200 a girl for everyone that she brought to his, his home in Palm Beach. And after being arrested, the, 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 the police quickly found that the case was too big for him, too big for them in their small department, and they had to call the FBI in to help. And as one FBI agent stated, they had enough proof, enough evidence to put Jeffrey Epstein away for the rest of his life. But then those involved with the case began to see to their horror that things were not going to go that way. Jeffrey Epstein was calling in some big favors for some very powerful people. And finally, his conviction ended in what his lawyer called a sweetheart deal. And one FBI agent, when she found out about the deal, broke down into tears at what he was able to get away with. For all the hundreds of girls that he assaulted, soliciting prostitution, statutory rape, Jeffrey Epstein got 18 months sentence. And after three months of that, was allowed 12 hours to leave the prison on work release. He was even able to hire some of the guards at the prison to dress in suits and, uh, and to, and to uh, use an abandoned office in the prison to run an office so he continued to work. With five months left on his, his, um, his sentence, he was allowed on, out on house arrest. And this house arrest included long walks on Palm Beach for exercise. And also, because it was house arrest, included his house in the Virgin Islands. It doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem fair at all. I actually hear about this in... The only reaction can be rage. Just outrage at someone who has done so much wrong could get away with it for so long. In fact, Jeffrey Epstein, I think, is the kind of person that Job had in mind when he said these words in verse 7. Why do the wicked live and reach old age and grow mighty in power? Their offspring are established in their presence and their descendants before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear and no rod of God is upon them. You know, when he said this, I will admit that he was feeling pretty negative at the time. He was feeling pretty pessimistic about his life and life in general. You see, Job was a righteous man and we're told that he was righteous, even righteous in the eyes of God. And even though God acknowledged him as righteous, Job had a host of misfortunes beset his house and his life. He lost all his property. He lost his family. He lost his health. And even his friends who presumably came to comfort him caused him misery and blamed him and his sin for all the bad things that had happened to him. And, and cast down like this, as, as, as often happens, when we get into situations where, where our misfortune just piles upon us, it, it makes us reflective. You know, it makes us reflective, and we, and we start to think, and we start to consider about life, and like, gosh, why do these things happen? What, what is life about? And, 
and, and we ponder these deep questions. And, and Job, as he was pondering these deep questions, he, he came to some realizations he found about life. And the one realization he came to, the one we talked about today, is Job opened his eyes and he realized that the wicked prosper. The wicked prosper. Some of the most evil people in the world seem to prosper the most, seem to have the most fortune, and seem to never get punished for the things that they do. Now, friends, I think this is a sentiment that we can all relate to. I think this is a sentiment that we've all felt at some time or another. I mean, we certainly, if you watch the news and you kind of pay attention to these things, you'll notice rich and powerful people getting embroiled in scandal after scandal, illegal act after illegal act, and what happens after a show of justice, sometimes a sham of a trial, so often they walk scot-free. They get out with hardly any sentence or a little slap in the wrist. And if they get punished, they don't get punished near as much as someone like you and I would get punished if we had done the same thing. It's kind of depressing. It makes you angry to think about the Jeffrey Epsteins of the world enjoying the fat of the land, enjoying so much goodness and pleasure in this world and getting away with any evil deed that they commit. It's enough to make you lose faith in the system entirely. And I'm not talking about the justice system, although many people have lost their faith in the justice system. I'm talking about the world system, the big one, the one that, the one that God's in charge of. And we, and, we, and we look at these things that happen and we can't help but question like Job did, why does God let them get away with it? I mean, how can he do that? What's he doing up there? Why is he letting so many evil people get away with doing their evil things? Why is he letting them prosper? And at the same time, these evil people prosper. So many good people. So many good people struggle to make ends meet. Now, I don't want to put myself in the place of God, right? I don't presume that. But, I mean, I can think of a better system. I think we all can think of a better system. If we want, we want to get together and just, and just brainstorm for a minute, I think that we can come up with a better system than seeing the evil prosper and get away with their evil. All right, and I'm just here, I'm just going to think off the top of my head for a minute. And I think a good idea would be to let the good prosper. How about that? How about the good people who work hard, who are honest, who are industrious, who treat people right? How about let them prosper? How about let them get wealthy? How about let them have, have good fortune and good luck and, and all their plans seem to work out like they want it to? I think that sounds like a good idea. And then the evil people, how about they get punished? How about they're always in poverty? They're always sick. They're always struggling. And none of their plans ever work. They have the worst luck in the world. I mean, I kind of like that plan. It sounds really good to me. Certainly sounds better than the plan we have that the evil prosper and the good suffer. Certainly better than the plan that all those girls that Jeffrey Epstein abused considered, con continued to suffer the trauma of their abuse while Epstein was serving his sentence on his private island in the Caribbean. So why is it that way? Why is it that so many evil prosper, so many evil people get away with doing terrible criminal things? Now, there, there is a part of it that, that's common sense. There is a part, if you think about it, makes sense why evil people can prosper. And that's simply the fact that evil people can do anything to prosper. There's nothing that's off the table for them. All right, if evil people really want to prosper, there's nothing standing in their way of doing whatever they want to get prosperity. If they need to lie, they'll lie. If they need to steal, they can steal. If they need to cheat, they can cheat. If they need to manipulate, they manipulate. And at times, at times, when they've needed to kill, they will kill as well. 
So for normal people, of course, there's things that we won't do in order to prosper. For good people, there's even, uh, there's even more things that we won't do in order to prosper. But you see, for evil people, they have no such boundaries. There's no such scruples. It's a lot easier to gain wealth and to gain power and to gain influence if you're willing to do anything to get it, if you're willing to cross any boundary, if you're willing to transgress any law, if you're willing to violate any command of the Lord. Now, I do want to pause for a minute and let you know I don't believe that all rich people are evil, okay? That's, that's a very evil, simplistic way to lump the world together. I've known a lot of very good people who have become quite wealthy, and they've done it through hard work, through good investing, and through shrewd money management. That's not what I'm saying is that, that wealth equals evil. I'm just saying that it's very easy for evil people to acquire wealth and power because they're willing to do anything to get it. That part, that part makes sense. That's not the difficult question we have to face. The difficult question we have to face is why does God let them get away with it? Why does God let them continue in their good fortune for so long without any punishment? Now, I wish we could look at Job and get a good answer for this, but unfortunately, Job is feeling very negative today. He's, he's really in a dark spot, and if you ask him, he'll probably just give you a real depressing answer. But thankfully, there's many places in the Bible where people have asked this exact same question. In particular, there's two Psalms, Psalm 73 and Psalm 37, where they address this very question of the prosperity of the wicked. Easy to remember. They're just two numbers. You reverse them. Um, I encourage any of you to read those two Psalms sometime this week, 73 and 37. But 73 opens up with a similar complaint. This is what he says. He says, I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as other are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. He makes a, a similar complaint that Job did. Wicked get to prosper. Wicked get to have good fortune. They don't seem to fear anything and they never get any punishment at all. And at one point, the psalmist even complains and says, why have I kept my heart clean in vain? Basically saying, I've tried to do good. I've tried to do what is right. But it hasn't done me any good. It's a real frustrating situation. It's a real frustrating when you ask what it is we can do to, to, to correct this. What's the right answer to the situation that we find ourselves in? And, and, and sometimes we're tempted, we're very tempted to take things into our own hands. And maybe that's the answer. Maybe that's what we need to do. Maybe our calling is, is we go out and we punish the wicked. I mean, we can see the evil. We can see the evil and as they prosper on the world, and God has given us strength. God has given us a, a just mind and, and a good heart. Maybe it's our job to go out and punish the wicked, to take God's justice into our own hands. I mean, maybe that's a good church mission for all of us as the righteous people of God to go out and execute vengeance and judgment on the wicked and evil of this world. That even feels like a holy calling, doesn't it? I mean, executing the vengeance of God, striking evil people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Well, we won't be the first group of people that have felt that way. That maybe if there is injustice in this world that needs to be fixed, that we need to be the ones that fixed it. And many people under that sort of desire have been led to do great violence in the name of God. The Spanish Inquisition, burning heretics at the stake, blowing up and bombing abortion clinics, calling out and engaging in holy wars. And as much as we like to say that this comes from a good place to see justice done upon the evil, to see the recompense of God upon the wicked, I don't know if there's any who have ever pursued this path that have not ended up doing great evil in the way. 
And all in the name of God piled up corpse upon corpse. See, God calls us to a much harder way. God calls us to a much more difficult way in dealing with the wicked people of this world. Romans 12, 19, the Apostle Paul tells us, says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. Not you will repay. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. It's not our job to go out and hunt down the wicked people. This is the divine prerogative to punish the wicked. And yes, sometimes we have the opportunity to carry out justice, and when we do, we should take that opportunity. Sometimes we are placed in a position where it's our duty to carry out justice, like if you happen to be a judge or if you are called one day to preside at a jury. And if you are put in that situation, you should work to carry out justice as faithfully as you can. Our call is to resist evil, not to punish evil people. Our call is to pursue justice, never revenge. If we pursue revenge, then we are taking God's job upon ourselves. And so often in our attempt to punish evil, we become evil ourselves. Often in our attempt to punish evil, we don't actually go after evil people. We go after different people. We go after people that don't agree with us. And there are some great, some really good people that started out great, but then found a way to dehumanize anyone who disagrees with them. Found a way to, to dehumanize anyone that they have claimed is evil. And in the process, it become much worse than what they sought out to punish in the first place. Now we're called to something much more difficult. Something that at first doesn't make any sense at all, doesn't seem to do any good at all. Wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord and wait and he will punish the wicked. That's not an easy thing to do, especially when you see so much of it going on in the world around you to wait on the justice of God. But wait, and Scripture promises us it will come. In Psalm 73, he says this. He says, Truly, Lord, you have set the evil in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. It says, a little while, just a little while, the evil seemed to flourish, but in a moment... In a moment, God will destroy them. Psalm 37 promises this. It says, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. This is something we teach all of our kids too, isn't it? The wrong way might seem like the easy way. The wrong way might seem like the, the, the good way to get what you want real fast, but you do wrong Somehow in the end, you'll have to pay for it. And Scripture tells us if God's justice seems slow, it's not because he isn't just. It's because he's showing mercy. And if God's justice seems slow, it's not because he doesn't care. It's not because he has no regard for what's going down on here in this creation that he has made. Make no mistake, no one can outrun the justice of God. And it may seem a long time in coming, but when it comes, it hits hard. When it comes, he brings the hammer down with all of his strength. For the faithful, for the godly, our job is not to carry out vengeance. Our job is to wait for the Lord. Our job is to trust in him. Our job is to let him do his job. And let him be the one to decide who gets punished and who doesn't. I think uh, the Jeffrey Epstein case is a perfect case in point. 
for the longest time it looked like that he was going to get away with it. For the longest time he looked like just another rich and privileged individual who was able to do whatever he wanted and to suffer no consequences. Once again it seemed like the wicked had prevailed but justice was waiting. Jeffrey Epstein a few years after his his first sentence was arrested again. This time his powerful friends abandoned him one at a time until he was all alone. This time his money was to no avail. And this time while awaiting trial, Jeffrey, uh, Jeffrey Epstein died in prison. Now officially it said it was a suicide. But if you do a little bit of reading about that, he died under very, very mysterious, very suspicious circumstances. And all we know for sure is that he died abandoned by all those he trusted. He died with his money availing him nothing. And we can say for sure that he has answered for every single one of his deeds. Trust in God. Wait for him. Believe in his, his good justice. And yes, the evil do prosper. Yes, the evil do seem to flourish, but wait a little while. And, it, and always, it always, I guarantee you, it always comes crumbling down. Psalm 37 tells us, in just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek, the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. Justice ultimately belongs to God. Vengeance always belongs to God. It is his right, it is his prerogative, and it's his time to punish or reward. For those of us who seek the Lord, we wait. We wait, we trust in him. We trust in his ways. We trust in his justice. And we even trust in his vengeance. In a little while, the wicked will be no more. But the righteous, the righteous will be established by God forever. To him be all the glory forever and ever. Amen.